Salguete, discípuli, soy el tutorísimo, tu profesor favorito, porque soy el único que es, streamea, y en el día de hoy te traigo la unidad 5, Unit 5, The Birth of the Modern World. I'm going to use, as usual, our beautiful presentation and our beautiful notes. So, let's get into it. A ver, here. Oh, yeah, remember that both of them are available for download in your virtual classroom. So this is our first unit of history and <clears throat> we are going to study in this course the modern world or the early modern age as the English historians say. The, this is, is this working? Yes. So we, are, uh, we have divided it in four parts, the beginning of the early modern age, humanism, the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Counter Reformation. As you can see, this is a very uh, ideological or intellectual uh, unit. The political and the military units will come later in this course. So let's get uh, started with the beginning of the early modern age. So the early modern age, or la de moderna en castellano, usually or traditionally started in, in 1453 with the fall of Constantinople and and then well uh, the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks and the end of the Byzantine Empire and the traditional ending was is this working yes with uh, or was with the French Revolution in the 18th century in 1789 however since these uh, changes are these changes between uh, eras are not something that happens during one day the real the real period of time we are going to study between the middle ages and the modern uh, and the early modern age is going to be the uh, second half of the 15th century remember this and during this uh, fifth, this period of the 50 years we are going to uh, witness several um, events in western europe among them we have a demographic and economic recovery we have that um, the population rose during this period after this big um, a big dip because of the the i will say it the black death or the black black but as you can see in the 15th century the century we are going to study the population started to rise again this means that uh, there was a rise in demand which led to an agricultural increase in production so we have agricultural surplus excedentes with this surplus the people and the, um, the merchants uh, were uh, all became uh, wealthier or became richer so the trade rose as well yeah, mostly in the Mediterranean Sea, the Baltic and the North Sea. This is Seville, well, Seville, no, Sevilla. In, uh, this is the 16th century, but as you can see, there are a lot of merchant ships well, and warships also in the river Guadalquivir. And also this is the period in which all these routes were very active, at least until the fall of Constantinople. This also led to an increase in production because these handmade goods were the ones that were traded. This is uh, an example in La Silandera de Velázquez, maravilloso cuadro. And also this led to the growth of cities because in these cities is where the trade and the, um, and the production took place. Also, uh, in social terms, we have to talk about the rise of the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie is this social class that lived in the cities and were uh, favored by the monarchs because in the cities the noblemen during the Middle Ages didn't have such power as, the, um, as uh, they had in their own fiefs. So, uh, these, bour these bourgeoisie were the ones who, uh, who traded were the merchants and since the uh, trade rose a lot this meant that the bourgeoisie became wealthier and richer and became also a powerful social class that is why for example they now start to appear in the paintings as you can see in this Flemish 
paintings and we have a lot of examples on them. This led to the <coughs> emerge, um, the rise of the emergence of the system, economic system called merchant capitalism. This is an example with a bill of exchange or a letra de cambio. And finally, all of these um, events led in a political way to the strengthening of the monarchy. In this is the era, this is the period of history in which the authoritarian monarchies were established. And we have a lot of examples, France, England, the Kingdom of Spain, when uh, Castile and Aragon joined, joined together, the Holy Roman Empire, and several other changes, also other monarchies. And what were the main characteristics for this? Well, here you have a better map. This you have to zoom in in order to, to read it. We have several characteristics of these authoritarian monarchies. <clears throat> they these, these kings created permanent armies. As you can see here, the permanent army of the Reyes Católicos in Spain with Fernando and Isabel. How were they able to create these permanent armies? Because now they collected more taxes due to the rise of trade and because they still could collect them in the cities, which were not controlled by the noblemen, but the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie had to pay taxes to the king. They were not privileged. Also, they set up uh, bureaucratic systems, for example, here in justice. Also, treasuries to control the administration and the finances of the kingdoms. And also, and finally, uh, the, they created diplomatic ties. They started diplomacy. And we have the honor to have the earliest or the most ancient um, embassy of the world, which is the embassy of Spain to the Holy See in Rome. Some of the most famous or most important uh, authoritarian monarchs, the Reyes Católicos in España, Francis I of France, or Henry VIII of England. So this is the summary of this fer the very first point of this unit. Remember, you can pause the video if you want to take some notes. We have to go on with humanism. Humanism is a cultural movement, it's an intellectual movement that appeared at this time, at the second half, well, actually during all the 15th century and later spread throughout Europe and this led to another big event such as the Reformation or the Renaissance. And this ideological or intellectual movement has several characteristics and they are the following. We switched from the theocentrism, so everything goes or everything revolves around God, every answer of every question can be found through God or through the Bible, for example, the creation of man. And we switch this to anthropocentrism. This means that, <clears throat> that uh, everything or um, the, the human being should be uh, put at the center of nature, at the center of knowledge, and not every answer should come from God, but through rational thought, which only the human being is able to perform. Also, we have that uh, another important characteristic is the rediscovery of the classical world. Uh, does this mean that during the medieval times they, they were not aware of the classic authors? Of course they were. But now they are, uh, the, these humanists are very interested in recovering this ancient ancient legacy. So we are going to see a lot of, for example, translations from the uh, classical authors, for example, here, uh, the bucolics by Virgil, and they are going to uh, translate them, not only, uh, well, because they were written in Latin and Greek, to their vernacular languages. So to Spanish or, well, Spanish Castilian or Aragonese or English, Italian, French, so uh, most of people could be able to read them. Finally, uh, we're going to see, or we're going to, well, to, we're, I'm not going to read these, uh, these authors here. You need to know the authors and the main books they 
wrote. The first, the very first humanist was Francesco Petrarca, who was an Italian guy, and he was the one who include the first one who included the classical authors in his um, in his books, in his writings. For example, he has a cancionnaire. He was a poet. Another important, or maybe the most famous one, is Erasmus of Rotterdam, who wrote a lot of books criticizing the religiosity of the Catholic Church, and later he was censored by the Inquisition, but we will come there um, in several minutes. For example, the Handbook of a Christian Knight, or his very own translation of the Gospels. Thomas More was uh, was um, the Chancellor of the King of England, of Henry VIII. He was later executed. He wrote a very interesting book called Utopia, in which he uh, he calls for a, a ideal society. He explains how an ideal society would work, an ideal society in which there were no kings and everyone was consulted in the most important matters. You need to know Thomas More wrote Utopia, which is a political treaty, and the other big, the, the another big political treaty was the Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, in which he uh, he states how a prince should rule in this new system, the authoritarian monarchies. Also, another humanist um, authors were Andreas Vesalius, which was the first one who was interested in um, in the study of the human body, or or Nicolas Copernicus, which discovered, which theorized with the, the heliocent heliocentric model, which later Galileo Galilei will prove uh, uh, that was right, in which the sun is the center of the universe and the and the earth revolves around it. And in Spain we have a couple of or two or three. Um, I will see it. I will say it. Humanists. Juan Luis, Juan Luis Vives, aquí con las disciplinas, Antonio de Nebrija, who wrote the very first Gramática Castellana or Castilian Grammar, and uh, also another ones like um, Miguel Servet, but it doesn't appear here. So, this humanist ideology was very successful, became very famous, and the data authors were, uh, were read a lot, so it spread very fast. Why was it able to spread very fast? Because the books uh, were also well, suffered a revolution. Before this time, books were copied by hand, by usually by monks in monasteries. But in the middle of the 15th century, around 15, around 1450, the year 1450, Johannes Gutenberg, a German guy, invented the first printing press in Mainz, Germany, and this allowed the diffusion, the spread of the works of many humanist and classical writers, their the distribution all around Europe. And this, uh, well, here you have how it worked. We have uh, some typographers who composed the text they were going to print using movable types. A movable type is every, each one of these pieces. Then the play was covered with ink. Then it was pressed in the printing press. So. It was printed in the paper, they were left to dry, and finally they were bound into a book. So he, uh, in this way, and the, um, the printers saved a lot of work and mostly a lot of time. So they could produce a lot more books than before, and by hand each one done by a monk. This meant that humanism spread a lot. Here you have a video if you want to and know how the printing press worked. No, we are not going to see it now. The first uh, book that, that was printed was the Bible, of course. This is a Gutenberg Bible, the 42-9. This is a mistake, also known as 42-line Bible. And this is Gutenberg with the first page of one of these Bibles. Another, the first bo printed book in Spain was the Complutensian Polyglot Bible, which was written in Latin, in Hebrew, in Greek and in Aramean. And here you have an interesting text in which the Catholic Church, the Pope, forbids the use of um, the printing press unless the books are authorized previously by the Catholic Church. 
this um, printing press had a lot of success until today, because today there are a lot of books printed, and it allowed the humanist uh, ideas to spread alongside these um, the academies, which were centers in, in which the humanists gathered to promote this humanist thought, who, in which they share ideas, and, and most of them are in Italy, his here is in Florence or in Rome, and finally the universities, which existed since the Middle Ages, and they were important centers of the humanist thinking, and uh, they played an important role in the transmission of this new knowledge. The most important ones, Bologna, Leuven in Belgium, or Alcana de Lares in Spain. So as you can see, the uh, humanism started in Italy and rapidly spread through all of Europe, and also the printing press started in Mainz, remember by Johannes Gutenberg, which also spread very fast through the continent. Here you have the summary and we go on with the Protestant Reformation. This is a process in which the, the church, the Western church, the Catholic church, spread or was split in uh, several branches due to a conflict that happened during the 16th century. And this happened because many people, uh, also influenced by the humanist ideas, started to question some attitudes of the Catholic Church. For example, The Luxurious Lifestyle. This is a book from Lucas Cranach the Elder, a reformed person, a Protestant person, in which he's criticizing and comparing the Pope with Christ in the Gospel. So here he's criticizing the extreme luxurious lifestyle of the Pope in Rome, which he calls the Antichristi, the Antichrist, and comparing it with the with Jesus Christ, which suffered a lot while the Pope is living a very good a very good life. Also, well, and for example here this golden cloth from Pope Alexander the Sixth. Also, the lack of culture and weakening of moral standards of the clergy. The clergy, since they have or they pronounce moral statements they should behave properly, at least as well as they promote. But, however, as you can see, there were many examples in which they set a bad example. For example, these drunken monks. Also, the buying and selling of ecclesiastical positions, which is called simony. It's a sin called simony because uh, Simon the Mage, which is which has a passage in the Bible, you can read it here in Hecho de los Apostoles, Facts of the Apostles. And uh, finally, the selling, and the most important one, the selling of papal bulls and indulgences, the selling of indulgences. An indulgence is the forgiveness for a sin. So it's a document that pretends to pardon the sins and grants and so allegedly grants access to heaven from the purgatory, both from the live for the living, the, the the alive ones and the dead ones. And this uh, became very popular at the beginning of the 16th century, and this was the like the casus belli, if we can say that, or the um, the immediate cause that motivated the the reformation because the pope this pope leo the 10th leon X, uh, sold or tried to sell a lot of indulgences to um, to reform the old saint peter's basilica and uh, to build the one that you can visit today and this was the immediate cause of Martin Luther's break from Rome, of the Reformation, because um, this selling of indulgences came to the city in which Martin Luther lived in, um, uh, in Wittenberg, Germany. So it became, it made him uh, very angry and he wrote uh, what is the so-called 95 Thesis, this document, which he nailed to the door of the All Saints Church in his home city, Wittenberg, in Germany. And this was the start of the Reformation. In this document, he, well, here you have a movie, which is Luther. If you want to see it, you can check the link. 
This guy, Martin Luther, which was a monk, he wrote this document, the 95 Theses, in which he uh, criticized, he condemned all the wealth of the church, and he mostly criticized and denied the value of these indulgences. And he advocated for a new religion, a new religiosity, apart from the teachings of the Catholic Church. Well, the ones that, the teachings that in that moment the Catholic Church were uh, praising, because at first he didn't want to break from Rome, but finally he had to do it. These are some examples or some of the 95 theses in, in, uh, in which he criticized the papal power and also he condemns the sale of indulgences. If you want to read them, you can check them out in the virtual classroom. These are today the, door of the, uh, the doors of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg. They are now engraved in bronze, the 95 th theses. After this, the Pope excommunicated uh, Martin Luther and he said, I don't care. So he burned the papal bull of the excommunication. And this started the break of the Protestants, of the Lutherans from Rome. They started a new reformation, a new religion or new religiosity. And the main, um, the main characteristics of this new Protestant religion are the following. We have the three soli. Here you, you can see five because they are the five actual soli, but at the time of Luther we have the three first ones. Sola Scriptura, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide in Latin. Sola Fide uh, means, whoops, Sola Fide means only by the faith. Martin Luther says that salvation can uh, only can come through faith. Only faith is needed in order to be saved. Uh, because uh, the only faith in God could lead to eternal salvation. You don't need the acts. You don't need the good works or the good, the good deeds that the Catholic Church is uh, requiring you. Then the sola scriptura. Sola scriptura means only by the Bible. It means that the Bible is the only religious authority. The one that... Um, that every believer should read. That is why he's going to translate the Bible, also influenced by the humanist thinking, to the vernacular language. In his case, he's going to translate the Bible to the German language. So this means that you need to uh, get involved with God through only through the Bible and not through any kind of priest. And finally, the sola gratia. Sola gratia means only by the grace. This doesn't appear in your notes, but remember it's included in the exam. It means that um, the, the salvation is a grace from God. So it's not a merit. It's not something you can earn, like in the Catholic Church, you can earn your path to heaven. But the, um, the Lutherans said that salvation is a grace from God, it's a gift from God. So you need to know these first three soli, only these. Solus Christus and Soli Deo Gloria are the fourth and the fifth one, but they uh, came later. Then we have the universal priesthood. This means that all baptized people were priests, so you don't need an external, if you can say so, priest, to um, get in touch with God. So the clergy was not an intermediary between God and the believers. They are only the ones who, um, who are in charge of the ceremonies, but that is all of that. Then, since we don't need priests, because everyone is a priest, they deny the sovereignty of the Pope. The sovereignty is the uh, supreme power. So they, they, they said that uh, the Pope is exercising a power that he does not deserve, so they will disobey him, and we, they also um, appoint him as the Antichrist. Then uh, they um, denied the worship of images, the worship of icons, because they deny the cult of the Virgin and the saints. That is why there were a lot of destruction of paintings or sculptures or even window glass um, 
uh, windows with the pictures of these saints in cities like in Zurich or in Antwerp and more of them. Also, they, they remove the religious orders. Remember, we don't need priests, so we don't need monks. So in many places, for example, in England, they were just uh, removed and all of the buildings or the goods, they were confiscated. Finally, they only have two sacraments, which are the baptism and the Eucharist. In the Catholic Church, we have seven. Why only two and why baptism and the Eucharist? Because are the only two ones that appear in the Bible. Remember, sola scriptura. Whoops, this is the summary. Remember, you can pause the video if you need it. And this reformation spread also very rapidly. How? Because of the printing press and um, through the same, uh, the same ways that humanists or humanism did. So, uh, this spread of the Reformation, well, we're going to start not with Calvin, but with the map. Uh, the Reformation is spread very rapidly and also there were uh, more, uh, more reformers. Martin Luther, which started uh, Lutheranism or the Lutherans, they were triumphant in Germany, in Denmark, and in the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, and Finland, which in, that, in this time was part of, uh, was part of the Swedish uh, territory. And there were also other reformers with new doctrines, Calvin and Henry VIII. John Calvin was a French priest, a French theologian, and he started a new type of Protestantism since uh, from his hometown in Geneva, in Switzerland. Calvinism, uh, the main idea of Calvinism is the predestination, which uh, means that God has decided the fate of every human being at the moment of, of his birth or her birth. So uh, the human being is going to be saved to, in heaven or condemned to hell at the moment of his or her birth. And God knows it. And uh, this uh, Calvinism, this new theology, uh, also was uh, spread very rapidly in Switzerland, in the Netherlands, in France, they were called Huguenots, in uh, Scotland, they were called Presbyterians, in England also, the Puritans, and, um, and more places. But these are the four places that you have to know. Finally, in, uh, in England, uh, Anglicanism started here because of the King Henry VIII. This king wanted to divorce from uh, his first wife, Cath Catalina Aragon, or Catherine of Aragon, Dios mío, but the Pope denied the divorce, so he uh, enabled or he enacted a new law, the Act of Supremacy of 1534, in which he appointed himself as the head of the Church of England. That means that all the Catholic hierarchy in England has to uh, swear loyalty to him. So, and now since he controlled the Church of England, he could um, grant uh, the divorce to himself, which he did several times because he had six wives. And uh, this Anglican, Anglicanism, uh, well, of course, uh, ruled over the English territory. And that's it. And this, um, all these three branches of the Reformation are still active today in these territories, more or less. Then the last part of uh, this unit is the Catholic Counter-Reformation, which is the answer is the reform, the own Catholic uh, Church Reformation uh, as uh, um, is the consequence of the Protestant Reformation in the Catholic countries. Um, this uh, Catholic Counter-Reformation had two main characteristics or two main branches, two main parts. The first one is the Inquisition. Inquisition already uh, already existed in several countries, for example, in Spain with the Spanish Inquisition, but it was established in Rome, in the, in the Holy See, in 1542. The Inquisition is an ecclesiastical court that persecuted the heresy, the heretics, the one who deviated from the dogmas of the Catholic Church. When 
they was a suspect of heresy, they, um, they had a trial which is called auto da fe. The most famous one is here, the one that uh, was held um, against Galileo because he supported the theories of Copernicus and uh, they were asked to uh, renounce to their beliefs and if not, they were burned at the stake. And the Inquisition has a lot of it's very famous with very bad, bad fame, mostly in Spain, but they, it was just an ecclesiastical court. Also, uh, uh, the Index of Forbidden Books was started, this Index Librorum Prohibitorum, in 1564. This was a list of books that uh, the, the Catholics, the baptized people, were not allowed to read and they had to uh, destroy and stop their distribution. For example, we have all the books of Machiavelli or of Erasmus. Here you have a, a censor book from Erasmus or Copernicus and, many, and, of course, all the books of the Reformed authors. The main, uh, the main action that the Catholic Church took was the summoning of the Council of Trent, which is a city in the north of Italy. During a, well, in a 18-year period, uh, in 1545, from starting in 1545, and the last session was uh, or happened in 1563. In this council, which is a meeting of all the bishops, they, uh, the Catholic Church, tried to correct their mistakes or her mistakes and to establish the dogmas for the Catholics that, uh, and most of them, are still active today. Before going to that dogmas, we have to say that all these, uh, all these new ideas were spread through the Catholic countries by a religious order, the Society of Jesus, los Jesuitas, which, uh, which is an order founded in 1540 by San Ignacio de Loyola, San Ignatius of Loyola, which was a Spanish guy from Azpeitia, Guipúzcoa. And um, finally, we have to talk about the decisions adopted in the Council of Trent. And here you have a very interesting um, table in which the, the both Catholics and Protestant um, beliefs are compared. First, the, the most important ones. Salvation is achieved through faith and good deeds in opposition to only the sola fide and the predestination of Lutherans and Calvinists, the seven sacraments instead of the two ones, baptism, confirmation, communion, penance, la penitencia, anointing of the sick, ostramoción, matrimony and the holy orders, and the worship of the Virgin Mary and the saints in opposition to the denial, remember the denial of the worship of images or icons. And the Mass is still the main act of worship. It is held in Latin and the Bible is read by the priest because the Bible is written in Latin. The priest must be celibate and the supreme power is held by the Pope in Rome. And we have an ecclesiastical hierarchy of bishops and cardinals. So we can see here the seven sacraments, baptism, Eucharist, penance, this is the Pope, confirmation, matrimony, the holy orders, these guys are becoming bishops, and the anointing of the sick. Here you have the seven sacraments in this beautiful painting by Roger van der Weyden. And this is the uh, Catholic Bible, which was the official version of the Bible until the 20th century, the Vulgate of Saint Jerome, La Vulgata, which was written in the 4th century and was written in Latin. That means the Mass was held in Latin. Also, the worship of Virgin Mary and the saints. This is a relic. This is the corpse of Saint Catherine of Roseque de Murcia. And finally, we have an ecclesiastical hierarchy in which the Pope is the supreme power and it is followed, he's followed by the cardinals and below them the archbishops, bishops, etc, etc, etc. Here you have the main important ideas. Remember, in the Council of Trent there were more uh, more decisions taken, you have them in the notes, the prohibition of the sale of indulgences, the exemplary life, the celibate, and the publication of the catechism. But uh, I can't write them down uh, here, so 
we uh, remember to take a look at the notes. And this is the end. This is a female bishop, uh, obispa, from the Anglican Church. Aquí. Pues ya hemos terminado, amigos y amigas. Espero que os haya quedado clarinete y si no, ya sabéis que me podéis contactar de mil maneras, los comentarios de YouTube, correo, aula virtual o si no, mi maravilloso Instagram. Recuerden seguirme, de hecho, en el Instagram y en el Twitch, que lo dejo abajo en la cajita de descripción. Mira cómo hacen los youtubers, de verdad. Y nos vemos en el próximo. Gracias por pasarse. Adiós.